Okay, so. All right, there we go. So I'm gonna talk today um, for about half an hour about split class. I'm right here. <laughs> so um, Bill is gonna be moderating and- And, and um, muting Tucker. And muting people. <laughs> and so I'm, I really, um, I really like this class of graphs, of split graphs. I started working on them. A lot of the work I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Karen Collins at Wesleyan, who is here, I believe, today, which is great because if I get, um, if I need backup, she's here, which is wonderful. And so we've been working on this topic for a while and recently put together a chapter for a volume. So here's the, here's the book, it's coming out this summer and it's edited by Lowell Beinecke, Marty Golumbek and Robin Wilson. And it's got chapters on various topics in algorithmic graph theory. And so we wrote a chapter on split graphs. And so that is what I'm gonna talk about today, sort of in preparing to write this chapter, we read a lot of the background papers and use some of our own research as well. And Bill, I think you were gonna say, if people have questions, they can put them in the chat and he's gonna somehow moderate and may interrupt me. Um, so that only one person is interrupting me, but not everybody's interrupting me. So go ahead if you have any questions. Yes, I'll monitor questions. the chat. Okay. All right, so split graphs are a wonderful class of graphs. They have a lot going for them. So let me begin with the definition. A graph is a split graph. If you can partition the vertex set so that one part induces a clique and the other part induces an independent set or a stable set, which we also call stable set. And we call such a partition a KS partition. And then we call such a partition K max if the size of the K part is the clique number of the graph that is the largest size clique in the graph. And we call it S max if the size of the stable set is the largest size stable set in the graph. So if you like to sort of hang on to models of graphs, you can think of a split graph, it sort of looks like a bipartite graph, except instead of both parts being an independent set, one's an independent set and one's a clique. You can think of it as a bunch of people where you can partition the people into two groups. One group is a bunch of people, all of whom know each other. The other group is a people, group of people, none of whom know each other. And then you can have any connections you want between those two sets. So here are a couple of examples. Both P4 and K13 are split graphs. P4 has a unique KS partition. So here it is on the left. And um, K13, however, has two different ones. So in K13, you can have the clique consist of one vertex and the split and the stable set consist of three, or you can have the clique consist of two vertices and the stable set consisting of the other two. And we call the one on the left here, this one is S max because the stable set is the largest stable set in the graph. And the one on the right here is K max. And for P4, the partition is both S max and K max. So here's a non-example, C4 is not a split graph. And you can see that because the largest clique in C4 is K2. So that's the biggest you can make the K part and then the other part is not a stable set. So you you're just out of luck. So here are some equivalents to being a split graph. One equivalent condition is the graph is chordal and so is its complement. So a chordal graph is a graph that has no cordless cycle. Um, so in other words, there's no induced cycle in the graph other than a C3. So if you had an induced cycle, it would have to have chords. So that's one characterization of split graphs. There's also a nice forbidden induced subgraph characterization, no 2K2, no C4, and no C5. So I love classes of graphs that have forbidden graph characterization. So split graphs definitely falls in that category. A consequence of the chordal part is that split graphs are perfect. Of course, chordal graphs are perfect and split graphs are chordal, so split graphs are perfect. That is, the chromatic number and the clique number are equal for the graph and all its induced subgraphs. You can also see that pretty directly right from the definition of a split graph. You can take a KS partition that's K max and you can convince yourself that the chromatic number of that graph is equal to the clique number by just doing a coloring. So here's a really nice theorem about split graphs. And it says that when you have one of these KS partitions of a split graph, then you're in one of the following three categories. Either you're in the category of being both K max and S max. That is the K is size omega of G and the, the stable set is also the largest stable set in the graph. 
or you're not in that case. And the alternative is you can be either S max or K max. So if you are S max and your stable set is the size alpha in the graph, then your K will be one less than the maximum size clique in the graph. Or if you have a K max partition, then the K is the clique number of the graph and the S is one less than the stable set, size the largest stable set in the graph. So exactly one of these three will happen for any KS partition of a split graph. In the first case, the partition is unique. As we saw with P4, there's just one way to do it. In the second case, you can go between these two possibilities by taking a vertex from one side and moving it over to the other side. So if you start with one that is S max, then there's a vertex in the stable set that you could push and move over to the K side and get one that is K max. Okay, so we call such vertices that can be moved back and forth to get from the second instance to the third instance, we call those swing vertices. All right, I'm pausing there, Bill, in case you wanted to interrupt with any questions. No questions so far, thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, so then Karen and I came up with these words balanced and unbalanced to describe the difference between these two situations. So we say a split graph is balanced if there's a KS partition that is both K max and S max and otherwise it's unbalanced. And so we're just going to, I'll remind you that K max, the terms K max and S max refer to a particular partition, whereas the terms balanced and unbalanced refer to the graph itself. Okay, so if you have a split graph, that split graph is either balanced or unbalanced, but K max and S max refer to the partition at hand of the graph. All right, so here's our examples again. So here's our P4 and this one, this partition was both K max and S max, so this one is balanced. And our K13, we had an S max partition and we had a K max partition. And so this, this graph K13 is unbalanced and you can see the green doesn't show up so well, but you can see there's our swing vertex. And over here, it's just got swung over to the K side. So you can get between those two partitions by just swinging that, P ver that pink vertex. Here's another lovely family of graphs, threshold graphs. So a graph is threshold if there exists some real number t greater than zero so that you can assign a positive weight to every vertex of the graph so that a set of vertices forms a stable set if and only if the weights assigned to each vertex in that set are less than or equal to this threshold t. So this is a nice family of graphs called threshold graphs. And here's a characterization of characterization theorem for threshold graphs. And again, look at it, it looks very similar to the one we had for split graphs. So it's a forbidden induced subgraph characterization and the forbidden graphs look quite similar to the ones we had for split graphs. So on the next slide, I think I put them up next to each other. Yes, I do. So here's the split graph characterization and here's the threshold characterization. And notice the only difference is the C5 versus the P4. So since the path P4 is induced in the cycle C5, if you don't have a P4, then you don't have IC5. And therefore, if you are a threshold graph, you are also a split graph. So because of the induced subgraph characterizations, all threshold graphs are split graphs. But now the question, so here's my little Venn diagram right up here. Here's our split graphs. And then somewhere in here are threshold graphs. Okay, but we just talked about the class of split graphs being divided into two parts, balanced and unbalanced. And so it's natural to ask those threshold graphs, where do they lie in terms of balanced and unbalanced? Can they be balanced and unbalanced or are they all balanced, all unbalanced? And the answer is that they are all unbalanced. Okay, so this is a little proposition. The reason is that balanced split graphs always contain a P4 and therefore, um, therefore they cannot be threshold graphs. And so therefore the threshold graphs have to be unbalanced split graphs. So this is a nice little result. I like to include a proof even in a short talk like this. And so I'm gonna show you the proof of this little result. So I'm gonna to prove to you that balanced split graphs contain a P4. So let's start with a balanced split graph and fix a KS partition of it. And this, is just, this next line is just notation. For any vertex in the clique side, we just let this stand for its set of neighbors in the stable set side. So I don't care about its neighbors within the clique, I just care about its neighbors in the stable set. And then I'm gonna let X be a minimum degree vertex. Oh, look at this, my pink is here, isn't that funny? Okay, X 
is going to be a minimum degree vertex in my clique side. So remember that we are in the balanced split graph situation, so there are no swing vertices. So X is not a swing vertex, so it cannot be swung into the stable set side. So that means it must have a neighbor over in the stable set side. So I'm going to call that neighbor such a neighbor Z. Okay, so there's Z. But now Z is also not a swing vertex because the graph has no swing vertices. So therefore Z cannot be swung into the clique side. So therefore Z must have a non-neighbor in the clique side. And that would be, I'm calling that Y. Okay, so so far I have X, I have Z, and I have Y. All right, so then what happens next? Remember, I chose X to have minimum degree in the clique side. So now that means that Y has degree at least as large as X. And since X has a neighbor, namely Z, that's a non-neighbor of Y, that means that Y must have a neighbor that is a non-neighbor of X. And so that neighbor must exist over here in, in S. So we're gonna call that one W. And now I know that X is not adjacent to W because remember W is a neighbor of Y that's a non-neighbor of X and voila, there's my P4. So it's a constructive proof that such a graph will have a P4. Okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna sort of shift gears and talk about a different, a different facet of split graphs and that is thinking of them from the perspective of degree sequences. So another wonderful property of split graphs is that you can tell whether a graph is a split graph or not just by looking at degree sequence. So if I, if someone hands me the degree sequence of a graph, they don't show me the graph, they just give me the degree sequence, I can look at that degree sequence and tell whether that graph is a split graph or not. And so together with Christine Chang, Karen and I were able to show that the classes of balanced and unbalanced split graphs have that same property. That is, you can tell whether you're in those classes just based on the degree sequence. So this, this uh, theorem looks like it takes up a lot of space, but let me just try to try to unpack it a little bit. If I start with a split graph and I have this as its degree sequence, so D1 starting with D1 is the biggest and then going down to Dn, then I let M, M is a good letter for this. It's sort of the letter that's used in the literature, but it stands for, it doesn't really stand for magic, but I like to think of it as magic. It's sort of the magic letter, the magic number in these split graph partitions. Uh, we also call it the mark. We let M, be this maximum value of i for which di is greater than or equal to i minus one. So remember the d's are going down and the i minus ones are going up. So there will be some last time in which di is greater than or equal to i minus one and that's what m is. And then it turns out that if this is the degree sequence of a split graph, then this k consisting of the vertices v1 through vm, the top, the top vertices, the vertices with highest the M vertices with highest degree will form the clique part and the rest will form the stable set part. And that this clique will turn out to be of size omega. So it will end up being a, um, a K-max partition. Okay, so um, just, I'll say another minute more about this. Um, so this is part of the standard proof of split graph recognition from degree sequences. And then if this dm is equal to m minus one, so here's my clique part, here's my k. So it starts with v1 and it goes all the way through vm. If my degree m, that is the degree of vertex m, is m minus one, that means that this vertex all of its neighbors are within the clique because it already has M minus one neighbors within the clique, which means it can't have any neighbors in the stable set part, which means it could be swung over into the stable set. It forms a stable set if it's brought over to S. And so therefore, once you have a swing vertex, you know you're in the unbalanced situation. And if DM is greater than M minus one, then everything in K has a neighbor in the stable set and so therefore cannot be swung over and therefore it is the balanced situation. So in any case, I did that proof a little bit fast, but the idea is that you can really use the same ideas of characterizing split graphs to characterize, to tell whether something is balanced or unbalanced from the degree sequence. And here's my example. So these are the two graphs we saw earlier. This first one is P4. 
right? And so I'm looking at the degrees of P4, 2, 2, 1, 1, and then I'm looking at I minus 1. So I'm starting with I equals 1. So it starts at 0 and it goes up. And so this is the last place where the top row is greater than or equal to the bottom row. And notice 2, two is strictly greater than 1, and that's the case that leads to balanced. Whereas if I look at my K13, its degree sequence is 3, 1, 1, 1. And so in that case, this is the last place where the top row is greater than or equal to the bottom row. And in this case, they're equal, and that is what leads to unbalanced. Okay, I'm gonna pause there again, Bill, and see if there's anything you want to interrupt with. It's all very clear. Everybody's happy so far. Okay. So now I'm gonna switch gears again. I'm really, uh, I'm just sort of giving you a little overview of our, our chapter on split graphs. The next section is about counting split graphs. So in 2000, Royal gives a very complicated formula for the number of split graphs on N vertices. And um, so here's just some of the numbers that come out of that. And in the paper with Christine Chang, we're able to count the number of balanced and unbalanced split graphs on N vertices. And so if you like looking for patterns, which I'm sure all of you do, you might stare at this and see if you see a pattern. So here's again, part of our history with the, um, with the Hampshire math program. Here's the number 17, right? And you can actually get that 17 by adding up all of those numbers. 9 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1, hopefully equals 17. So, and that is true in general. If I also add up 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4, I get this 8 over here. So what this is saying is that 17, which is the number of unbalanced split graphs on five vertices, is equal to the number of split graphs on four or fewer vertices. So that seems kind of counterintuitive, but it is really the case that the number of unbalanced split graphs on five vertices is equal to the total number of split graphs on four or fewer vertices. So we call that our compilation theorem. And um, in fact, we show that there's not only are the numbers are equal, but we find a bijection between the class of unbalanced split graphs on n vertices and the class of split graphs on n minus one or fewer vertices. And our original proof of this is a very complicated, you know, sometimes you don't get to things the, the easy way the first time. It's a very complicated series of bijections between split graphs and something that we call NG graphs, which stands for Nordhaus Ganim graphs. But in hindsight, we came up with a much shorter proof of this. And again, maybe I won't go through all the details. I'll just um, indicate how this goes. Um, we start with an unbalanced split graph on n vertices. We find an S, we take an S max representation of it. So I have an example at the bottom here. And since it's unbalanced, it's going to have a swing vertex. So we grab a swing vertex. And I think I'm grabbing, where's my swing vertex? It must be this thing grab a swing vertex, yep, yeah, because I'm S max, so the swing vertex is gonna be on the S side. And then I remove that swing vertex and I remove anything in K whose only neighbor in S is that swing vertex. So in this case, I'm gonna remove this vertex as well because this vertex's only neighbor in S is that swing vertex. And I remove those two things and I end up with a split graph on fewer vertices, okay? And then that process can be undone. There okay, is one question, Ann. All right, go for it. Mark asks, does the more obvious recurrence that only relies on the previous column have an easier proof? Um, you mean like the nine plus eight equaling 17? I think that's what he probably means. Go ahead and speak up, Mark. Yes. Um, does that have an easier proof? Well, Maybe, not in my head at the moment. Karen, do you have an easier proof? I love having Karen here. Uh, okay, I'll think about it, see if I can come up with anything. Yeah, that by the time, time I, by the time I finish the talk, Karen will have come up with something if there's something easier. But anyway, it's a good question. I was actually thinking that myself because you're right. When you're looking for patterns here, the first thing you see is a nine plus eight equals 17, not that whole row equals 17. I think that's just a, a sort of a corollary of the way we originally got to this was not with a nine plus eight equals 17. But um, I don't know the answer to that. Although I think that this proof is actually quite, quite short. Um, but whether there's an even shorter or an equivalently short proof of the other thing, I'm not quite sure at the moment. 
Okay, so I think actually I am getting to the end. I guess I might as, since I have a couple of minutes, I'll finish the other direction of the proof. So conversely, just reverse this process. If you start with a split graph that has n minus one or fewer vertices and you take an S max partition of it, then add this vertex back, right? Which is the one that was the swing vertex that got removed before and add enough vertices to the K part so that you get back to N vertices and then add those new vertices, the new vertices are adjacent to the things on the clique side and also to the new vertex you added and you're back where you started from. Okay, and I guess this being a swing vertex, I'd have to add that as well. And that's what gives me this graph on the right. All right, so that I've reached the end of my slides and I'll just, uh, I just grabbed the table of contents from our chapter and I'll just go through and tell you what I talked about and what I did not talk about. So I guess I talked a little bit about introduction. I talked a little bit about related classes of perfect graphs, not a lot, but a little bit. I talked about the degree sequence characterizations. I didn't talk about the Ferris diagrams and majorization section. I didn't talk about the three part partitions and NG graphs and pseudo split graphs. I did talk about the um, bijections and counting a little bit. And I did not talk about the Tishkevich decomposition. And in addition to having Karen here, which I very much appreciate, I think Mike Barris is also part of this call. And Mike has, um, has written several papers in which he uses the Tishkevich decomposition of graphs in order to prove results. So even though our book chapter isn't publicly out yet, um, if you're interested in learning about the Tishkevich decomposition, I would send you to Mike Barris at University of Rhode Island and his website um, lists his papers on that subject. So I will stop there, thank you.